Hi, everybody, and welcome to Talkward. I'm Marty Dundix, editor-in-chief of Weekly Humorous Magazine, and this is Talkward, a fun little podcast where professionally funny people come to tell awkward and cringeworthy stories. Uh, I'm very excited about today's guest. He has been on this program, I think, two other times before, maybe more. He's a, uh, a recurring guest because he always has new hilarious projects out to talk about, and he always has interesting things to, uh, to, uh, to share about himself that I've never known before. So it's always a wonderful treat to have uh, Mr. Mike Sachs on the big show. Hello, Mike Sachs, comedy call- writer, author, extraordinaire. I didn't know Mer- you were calling. You caught me mid- mid-sleep. I just I just turned over, and there you were. Hello, sir. <laughs> the old the old don't open the door. I'm I'm just changing. That's right. You know, don't I, come I, in here. I have a stand-up desk, but I just thought oh, I'm too lazy for even that today. I'm just gonna lie down. Papa gonna relax. This almost looks like a hotel room you're in, but this is your actual house. This looks like a very cheap motel room off of I-270 in Gaithersburg, <laughs> Maryland, which you are quite familiar with. It's like a motel. It's like a roadside motel. Yeah, yeah. Lots of vacancy, no HBO. Right next to a fake lake. Yes, next to the fake lake. I used to. That's the thing I used to love about and still love when you drive by any of these hotels or motels. In Maryland, Delaware, Eastern Shore, when you're driving down, or any of them, all the way down the East Coast, is they advertise that they do have HBO. <laughs> right. And sometimes air conditioning. Vacancy, no showtime. It's an interesting thing. In the, in the day of the streaming, mm-hmm. I wonder if they, it, they, they've it updated that to be like, we do have Hulu. We do have HBO Max. I wouldn't even care about that. I would peacock available here, but no towels. Or yeah, I would. I would hope there's towel, no towels. I don't even care if there's no bed bugs. I mean, that to me is my main concern. Or uh, you know, if you ever bring a purple light into one of those motels and check out, you do out, not do that. You do not do that. You I mean, don't want to know. You don't want to know. I want to do it in my bedroom here. See what I discover. It's a, it's a custard explosion. Oh Jesus, that's horrible. <laughs> Good Lord, man. That's awful. It's horrible. We don't want to put a, a, a purple light in that room. No, I don't want purple light anywhere. I don't know if you've noticed, but I decorated my set here with hidden objects just for you. Really? Yes. I don't know. Now, if we, now if I've we can, set up. If we can do a little, like, one of those spot it type games. I can't really see. I mean, you're you're a little square right over here. All right, so now I'm big. There we go. Yeah, I see um, Old Bay. I see O's. Oh, love it. Yeah. O's are um, getting set to start up real so soon. So that was just for nice. you. Some little love Maryland that. touches because you're a yeah. Marylander. You, yeah, baby. You, we get the same references. I'm from yeah. outside of Annapolis, a small town called Severna Park. Oh, yes. Know it well. That's the uh, DMV. It is the DMV. Let's and explain what up. that means to people. That's D.C., Maryland, and Virginia, as opposed to Delmarva, which is Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, and that's on the coast. The Delmarva. Delmarva's news leader is what they say in the news over there in Delaware. And uh, I grew up going to or avoiding, but we would go down when we wanted to be kind of like a little bit dirty. You go down to the Ocean City, Maryland. Oh, yeah. Down to the boardwalk, down to oh, Buddy's yeah. Crabs and Ribs. Real nice. And uh, it's just like everything that you would think about a 80s nostalgic childhood summer movie Mm -hmm. would be wandering around the boardwalk in Ocean City, Maryland. All the sounds, all of the game sounds, the Ferris wheel sounds, the people screaming, the funnel cake, the old wooden boardwalk with, uh, you know, that kind of old wood and you're getting like a splinter, (laughs) the sound of the water, the sound of someone getting like their purse snatched. Just all that magicalness is Ocean City, Maryland. The smell of fudge. I know it very well. Fudge, I mean, I went yes. there all the time. Candy I Kitchen. Went... Oh, yeah. Um, what was the name of that taffy place? Sally's or something? Uh, the Saltwater Taffy. Yeah. Um, 
something taffy. Yeah. But I used to go there. I went there for senior week of um, senior week. Me too. We all did this for people watching and listening. Also, this is live. So if people are watching and listening on uh, the Internet and if they have a comment or question for Mike Sachs, author extraordinaire, you can type it wherever you are, whether it be YouTube, LinkedIn, for for all those employed out there and um, Twitter and uh, Twitch. You're on the Twitch. You're taking a break from your live streaming, your games. You're going to come over here. You're going to take a little chill pill, and you're going to watch Mike Sachs talk about comedy books. You can ask him a question, and we can see it on the big screen. Last time I did this, the first time I said, ooh, let's do this, take a question. I did it live, and it was like a spam comment about, do you want interaction <laughs> with your live stream? <laughs> I was like, oh, do, damn it. I should have read that first. Do you have problems with your erections? <laughs> do you have the bent banana? <laughs> you know... Uh, that was a place in Ocean City, wasn't it? Right off the boardwalk, the bent frozen banana. The bent frozen banana. Well, speaking of Ocean City, now for my, I, I have my podcast back. It's called Doing It with Mike Sachs, and whenever I feel like putting it up, I put it up, maybe once a month or so. And there's sort of written sketches, and upcoming will be uh, War of the Worlds, but as done in Maryland, and it takes place in Ocean City. So you oh, have I love that. that to look forward to. Have you already recorded it? No. Do you want to do some Maryland accents for me? I will be anything oh, in perfect. that. perfect. I'd yeah, love yeah. to be something in that. That would be so yeah. wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Hon, uh, come on, hon. Let's get out of the shore. Oh, no way. Come on. We're going down to 105. How about them O's, hon? <laughs> oh, you're crazy. See, this is the thing about Maryland that people don't understand and really don't give a shit about if you're not from Maryland. There are a few different Maryland accents. There's Baltimore and then there's Southern Maryland and then there's Frederick, Maryland. So it all these are very nuanced. And you just did a Baltimore accent, which I really didn't grow up with. I grew up in Southern Maryland uh, towards Virginia and was more at that time was more white trash than it was yeah. Baltimore. Baltimore. It's got Baltimore. Baltimore, hon. Yeah, real nice. It's a little marbly. It's kind of like you got some marbles in your mouth. And in your head. I mean, Baltimore and is in an interesting head. place. I used to love going there to go down to the um, Inner Harbor for the, yeah. uh, down, you know, you go, go to the aquarium, you can go to the Science Center, you yep. go to the uh, Hooters. Yep. Just a, a plethora of educational places. Yeah. Well, the Hooters um, is still there. I was just down there a couple months ago. And that place, it's interesting. I grew up with the Inner Harbor. That was the first Inner Harbor that sort of took off. I guess Baltimore's Faneuil Hall and then uh, Baltimore's Inner Harbor. Was and place- Camden Yards. Everyone copied the Camden Yards after they did it. That's right. But Inner Harbor was even before that. But if you yeah. go now, the Hooters is still there, but everything is looking very kind of dated in that area. Yeah. But what's interesting about Baltimore is how great it looks beyond that area. Now, how it's spreading out and areas that in no way I would have gone to in years past are just booming. And it's just a great place. Uh very reasonable prices, great restaurants, uh, just a good place to live. I was really impressed by it. Because when I was a kid growing up, there were some sketchy areas that you can see. Oh, fair. I mean, very. It was very sketchy. The Baldwin, you know, the Inner Harbor area, they had sort of revitalized, and that was a really good spot. But then if you went a couple of blocks away, it got very different very quickly. And But then they kept going. So, But, like, the wire, all that business, like, that was legit. That was accurate like it was a oh, yes. rough and rough and tumble it, town it terrible but, east baltimore is rough but it's so close to so many good things like baltimore is such a good city because it's so close to dc and you're close to philadelphia and you're, you're close to the water you're close to the beach like it's a very good it's not like you're out in ohio you know like where you're in the middle of nowhere right ba- but you're also you're, you're close to west virginia too and that has a huge influence and not always in a good way that's true but they have good, like, uh, mountains. It's good, you know, go up to Deep Creek Lake. Yeah. Oh, used to go yeah. All the time. Oh, it's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Baltimore's a very underrated city. But if you watch John Waters movies from the 70s and 80s, that's the Baltimore that I remember. And it was even areas now that you would, um, you know, $300 a night hotels. That's where John Waters would film at, at that time. And it was grotty. It was rough. John Waters is great. The best. I invited him to, in Baltimore. I was opening for David Sedaris and I invited John Waters and his office staff to come to uh, see the show. And after I read my little piece beforehand, I, I gave a shout out 
to John Waters. And I basically said, or here I was a kid from the suburbs of DC, a straight kid who insisted, and this is true that my, my father, when we would go to Orioles games, I always made him drive around the areas where John Waters would shoot these movies before or after the game. And these at that time were not safe areas. And just the yeah. fact that my father would do that looking back was just like the sweetest thing any dad could do. Cause I can tell you, I wouldn't do it for my daughter. If it was a, if it was an area like where my dad would had to drive through. Dad, I want to, I want you to drive me around. Uh, I mean, what do we have? Like crown Heights, East New York, like just like what's near us. That's kind of like, I don't know what East Although New York. Or East they New York. are, they're shooting that TV show, East New York, which is, it, it's interesting. I mean, we live in, in the, in the, the Brooklyn area and we're both in Park Slope, but how 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 would you feel if there was a specific neighborhood that the TV world has decided we're going to use the real name of a neighborhood and we're going to make this like the crimiest, most terrible neighborhood that we could come up with and, and have a traumatic show about it every single week? It's like, but yeah, it's like, it would be like if they, if they made a show called like Park Slope, but it was like crime ridden and terrible. And you're like, hey, I live there. Hey, you know, it's not that bad. What are you talking about? Yeah, but here's the thing. It's always it's always like that anyway. I mean, look at the Real Housewives of Potomac. It's total fiction anyway. And I think if you are from that area, that uh, it, it's interesting to see how they sort of Hollywoodize it. But I mean, quite frankly, I mean, there's not many horrible areas left in New York. East New York is rough. It's rough, sure. But everything gets nicer in New York. That's the thing about New York. Like it's constantly just like improving nonstop. And getting more and more right, right. expensive to the, to the point where I have to probably move out because this price in Park Slope is just ridiculous. Excuse me as I plug in my headphones. It seems like they're going out of power. Everyone's coming to live with me. Just everyone's going to pile in down in North Slope. It's going to be great. I don't know You're if I need to live in New York anymore. Would you want to live in, in Baltimore or in the Maryland area? I would love that. But, you know, my daughter is going into high school. And um, most likely we'll go to college. She doesn't like the South. She wants to go up Northeast. So I, I, my wife is from Maine, so we probably will end up in Maine. Although, quite frankly, the housing up there is not that cheap either. No, Maine's very nice. It got very popular because of that uh, Jessica Fletcher and her murder she wrote. Everyone's like, I want to live in Cabot Cove. Although a very high murder rate for a small town in Maine. You, yeah, you wouldn't think it. Surprisingly high murder rate for such an old woman. Exactly. All right, look at me. I'm double. I'm multitasking here. He's looking. He's making his bed while he's on the podcast. It's amazing. This guy. And while he was making his bed just now, he wrote two more books. Can you hear me? I can. Now you just said I wrote two more books. I did, but they're not good. <laughs> they're not good books. You've written a ton of books. Um, you have, of course. Uh, poking the dead frog, you poking, got a dead frog. poking a dead frog, and here's the kicker: sex, our bodies, our junk. Is that your first book? Oh, um, I forget if it was my first one of the. F well, I don't even remember. There were three books I wrote early on. One, one was, and here's the kicker. I think that was the first book. Uh, that was a collection of interviews with comedy writers. And then uh, Your Wildest Dreams Within Reason, which is a collection of McSweeney's and New Yorker pieces. And then Our Bodies Are Junk. But I, for, I forget the order. And you have Randy, the full and complete unedited biography and memoir of the amazing life and times of Randy S. Yes, that was self-published three years ago. And it was just put out again by Random House and Archway Publications. And that's and that's happening with two books. Yes, Randy and Stinker Let's Loose. So Stinker, Stinker Let's Loose, which was a phenomenal hit, became a huge uh, audio uh, juggernaut, which uh, sure. turned into a live, amazing live show with these incredible com comedy actors. You had John Hamm, you had Andy Richter, you had a huge list of people that were cast in Stinker Let's Loose, which is a pretend novelization of a never existed 70s trucker movie right it was a non-existent 1977 movie trucking and cb movie called stinker let's loose which that is like a smoky in the bandit type parody 
all those movies that I loved as a very young child. I mean, it's interesting because you just don't hear about them anymore. I mean, Burt Reynolds was the biggest movie star in the world for a number of so years. So big. Huge. So Smoking the Bandit, Hooper, um, and then you would have, um, you know, all the TV shows. Uh, and everything was Southern at that time. When What just, was the movie that I, I, and I now I'm blanking on the name. Um, Highballing? Uh, uh no it was the one about uh the everyone was a, it was like a car race um all across the united states and they had yes. to get there and they yeah, were all yeah, driving yeah. different kinds of cars and the one guy had yeah. a car that had a monkey driving the front it was like of a course. limousine um yeah i know exactly what that i'll think of it in a second but every movie in the 70s had a chimp or an orangutan giving the finger to the sheriff I and mean, that was a yes big, i'm not sure why and bj uh well, not bj and the bear but um uh, Every Which Way But Loose with Clint Eastwood. Mm -hmm. But for a number of years, everything was Southern. The truckers ruled the country. It was during the Jimmy Carter era. And as soon as Reagan came in in 80, everything kind of flipped to the Northeast, whether it was Wall Street with Greed is Good or whether it was New York Urban with um, breakdancing and rap and that sort of thing. But for four or five years, Southern pop culture ruled yeah, and that's really what I just don't see. I didn't see being parodied, um, but it was interesting because when the the book went out to John Hamm, the one of the reasons he took the role as Stinker was because his father owned a trucking company in uh, Missouri, so he was very familiar with that world. Um, you know, it's funny. You just never know when someone or why someone says yes, and that was his reason. I think it reminded him, like it did of me of a certain time uh, post Watergate where the uh, rural Southern guy became the hero to emulate cannonball run. That was, there the you movie. go. There cannonball you go. Cannonball run. And Jamie run Farr too. was in all those movies. Uh, those were fun movies because they had like so many stars. It was almost like the battle of the network stars, but a movie. And they would just cram all of this talent into one place. They probably told them like they had to shoot for like four days. And they had to be in all these movies. Yeah, an interesting uh, grouping too. Dean Martin would usually be there. Jamie Farr, all these. It'd be uh, like and like Frank Sinatra would just be like yeah. a cameo. They would get wearing, cameos from everybody. Right, wearing a members only jacket on the way to the airport, he would just show up. It was very yeah. loose, and that's what I liked about these movies. It was like watching friends make a movie, and then there would be bloopers in the end, which I had never seen before. They did not exist. You would never see that on the big screen ever. Yeah. And, the last five minutes of Smokey and the Bandit or any of those movies would all, would always be Burt Reynolds cracking up the entire... Uh, it would just be them screwing up. And Dom DeLuise giggling. I mean, I love that Dom stuff. DeLuise. There was a... Um, there's a spice that I use in the kitchen, and uh, it, it, it it's like a Chef Paul something, and I always thought that was Dom DeLuise on the, uh, on the side. Paul of Prudhomme. Room. I used to see Paul him in Prudhomme. New Orleans when I lived Paul in New Orleans. Prudhomme. Paul Prudhomme looks just like Dom DeLuise on the side of the, of the, of the spice thing. Because uh, he has Paul the same... Prudhomme, he had his own scooter. He would, he would zip around the French Quarter in it. <laughs> he seems like a large man to be zipping around a scooter. Well, that's why he had a scooter. The guy couldn't walk. So, I mean, if you're large for New Orleans, that says something. He, he would scoot around Bourbon Street and all the other streets in his little puff, puff, go machine. Oh, that's right. You're a New Orleans guy. Yeah, I lived there for close to 10 years. That's a fun area. I went there for a wedding for a weekend, and I had never been before, and I had lots of beignets. And I, oh, I went to, yeah. I didn't go to the fancier one. I went to Cafe Beignet. Yep. Because you it was no, Dumont's. Well, Dumont yeah, is hardly Dumont fancy. Was, do, well, yeah, but the line was so long because yeah, everybody true. went there because it's very touristy. So yeah, nobody yeah. was at Cafe Beignet, which is a very delightful, beautiful little spot. And it's I could all just the sit same there. Shit. It's all fried dough. It's just fried dough. I had fried dough in a newspaper every morning. It was great. With chicory coffee. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. So, the, what's the process? So, the sticker lets loose. And also, we're going to talk about the newest book, which is Welcome to Woodmont College No Refunds, which is a hilarious parody of a, a college course catalog. But for uh, the Stinker Let's Loose, you make this book, which you created on your own, and you self-published this book, even though it's, you know, it looks like an amazing book. It's well laid out, well designed, great cover, great uh, painting of a monkey which driving got, a car. Done by my wife. I mean, the whole point, well, we can get into that, but self-published books, one of my pet peeves is it always looks like shit. So I wanted this to look as good as possible and also as realistic as possible to an actual book 
from 1977, even complete with fake rips and tears on the cover. It does. It has that weathered look. It has a great color scheme of the 70s and the fonts. Um, you know, it has that uh, that sort of montage photo, uh, you know, put put together with all the different aspects of the of the movie all, all crammed into that nice circle. So your wife did this painting, which is a great painting. And then you have the book. And then do you send it to John Hamm first and say, I, if I can get if I can get John Hamm, I can get a bunch of other people. No, I mean, what's interesting, and I tell this to young writers, is that sometimes you have to make things happen. And it only happens if you have something tangible to present to somebody. So if I was pitching this book or this idea for an audio project, no one would ever say yes to this. But what I did was I just thought, the hell with it. I'm going to write it. Take a couple months to write it. Uh, um, design it. Have my wife design it. Then girlfriend, now wife. And put it out. And let's just see what happens. I didn't expect anything. So I put it out. I did that. And a couple of weeks later, a guy named Eric Martin, now a friend of mine, uh, he's one of the top uh, voiceover artists in in L.A. He does readings for uh, everything. He said, can I have the rights to this? Can I try to sell this? And I was like, sure. And like two days later, he calls us at Audible is interested. Audible is through Amazon. And I said, great. He goes, and Audible will now be reaching out to various people. Now, this was in the very beginning of these actors and comedians getting involved in audio projects. And I think because of that, it helped my chances. So like two weeks after that, he he calls and said, all right, John Hamm's in. It's like, what the fuck? Now, I had some dealings with John Hamm before. He had posed for one of my author photos. We had been a little friendly. But, you know, there was it was no guarantee. But it does go back to saying, listen, here's a product. You can hold it in your hands. It exists. And at that point, it's easier to talk people into being interested in it and taking it to other mediums because it exists. It's a real product. It's not just a figment of my imagination. They don't have to imagine this thing existing and actually exists. Yeah. So I really do feel in retrospect, and I didn't know at the time, is that you we really do have to produce something and you have to be have something tangible to hand off to somebody rather than rather than pitching them an idea that's never been done before. This had never been done before. So they had yeah. nothing to base it off of. It, it seems like, and, and I'm right there with you with publishing to get like, an idea together, because it seems like people are much more um, receptive to the idea of adapting a, a product that already exists than, having mm -hmm. a pitch deck given to them or an idea or a treatment or like a one sheet where they have to like imagine what it could be like. Right. If you can tell them what it is and they can hold it in their hands, they can yep. be like, okay, this is something like, this is already something I can take this already something and make it into something else. Right. If a, a figment of an imagination or a presentation sometimes just isn't, doesn't stick as well, well as like a book can stick. Totally. And especially when it comes to comedy, a lot of people that you're trying to sell to, uh, producers, editors, publishers, audio uh, designers, what have you, they may not have the same comedic sensibility that writers and creators do. You know, their comedy IQ may not be as high as you may want. So if it's never been done before and you don't even know if it can work, if it is done, then it's it's not surprising that a lot of these ideas won't um, pique someone's curiosity if and that the fact they can't imagine it because it's never been done before. You can't say it's, it's this plus this equals this. So if it is really new, it's even harder to get it, get it made and to convince someone to take a chance on it, which is why I think it's important if you do want to do something new and, it, and it's never been done before, especially comedically, you really do have to put it out, whether it's a video, whether it's a book, whether it's a short story, whether it's a pamphlet, whether it's a graphic novel, whatever it is, uh, to take it to the next level, you have to spend the time uh, not just to convince them that it'll work, but oftentimes you don't know if it's going to work it because yeah. it's so new. Also, with a book, it's so much you can write something and someone reading it and and thinking about it. Like when you read a book, it's in your head. So it's whatever you picture is happening. So that production in your mind is going to look better than anything I could make on my own for like a video example, right? you know, 
because I don't have a budget like that. Right. But, but like your your imagination is like there's no budget, you know. It right. can be huge, and as long as the pages, as long as the words on the pages describe it correctly, it can seem fantastic. Right, and you can't really fault someone for. I mean, you know, I've thought a lot of times, why can't you just see what I see in my head? Well, you can't. You, you know, oftentimes I can't see what's in someone else's head, so it's yeah. not really fair to do that. It does take extra time. I mean, this took me six months to do from beginning to end, designing it and everything else when I could have been working on other things. I had no idea whether it would work. I had no idea whether anyone would be at all interested in it. So you do sort of have to take a chance sometimes and uh, just pull the trigger and do something that you don't know if it'll work or that you'll get money from. I mean, I didn't get money from it until, you know, much later. So you have to take a chance. And this started, this was the first of a few um, fake uh, novelizations that you've done that it's, it's, it's a great niche of comedy because there are so many uh, 80s movies, 70s movies, novelizations that I've, I've actually come across. Now I think of you, every time I see them, I'm like, oh, this is like a Mike Sachs book. But it's real. <laughs> like I just came across, it was Ghostbusters 1 and 2 a novelization. Yeah. And I was like, I kind of want to buy this now just because of you. <laughs> wow. Well, it's, in, I mean, I don't want to be pegged for doing this, but at the same time, I mean, I do enjoy writing poorly and on purpose. And I, <laughs> I think there's, there's a talent in doing it poorly, but just enough that, you know, it's hard to write poorly. Well, where it's, where it's interesting. Because what you're satirizing is not well written. So how do you then satirize it without also making it poorly written? So it's a you're very... satirizing it and simplifying it. So it's like you're doing both. Like you're 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 watering it down and you're dumbing it down, but it's already dumb. It's already dumb, but at the same time, with Stinker Let's Loose, it does give you a vehicle um, in which that you can then take on different aspects of america at that time late 70s whether it was racism whether there was the oncoming uncom upcoming slot onslaught of the republican conservative movement um whether it was these movies that never featured any asian characters unless they were stereotypical chinese tourists taking photos so there's a lot you can sort of get in there uh and satirize within this element of this fake novelization it's interesting going back and looking at anything that is like just these blatantly terribly racist uh, 80s and 70s and even some early 90s and mid 90s and even early aughts. There were still little bits of it speckled throughout some TV and some movies that obviously written from maybe old, an older point of view that hadn't really gotten the memo. And things at this point, like now, we notice things so quickly. Oh, God, yes. You know, it's almost like you hear, you're you hearing a bad noise. You're hearing some kind of a buzz, and you're like, oh, my God, or something tastes terrible, or something, it's you incredible. know? Yeah. It's, it's, so, it's so tone deaf, but, like, so quickly. You're just like, oh, God, I can't believe oh. that was only 10 years ago or five years ago in something. They're, like, they make a joke about this or that. You're like, God, I can't believe they did that. What a, what a jerk. Well, it's you, nice it's to see how quickly that things have progressed. It's incredible. I mean, I was watching Rockford Files. Don't ask me why the other morning. And it's one of the it's early a great episodes. show. Are you kidding me? It's a great show. But there are aspects in it. You, it just makes you shudder. Like there yeah, was one scene where um, Jim Rockford uh, makes a homophobic remark. And like at that time to watch it, like, I don't know if it would have even been funny then. But you see it now and it's like, holy crap, there's no reason for that. Or I was watching John Hughes movies with my daughter and you know, watching 16 Candles with the Asian character and the rape scene. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a ton it's of like, stuff from 80s wow. movies. It's just, I didn't, it's like a smell gone And bad. you want to go in and you want to pluck out like this, like the one or two like terrible moments in an otherwise very wonderful movie in your, in your childhood, in your nostalgia. And you want to be able to show it to younger generations because you loved it, but you can't show it to them the way it is right now because you're like, and now I have to explain how... Yeah. That's really terrible. And yeah, it's, I'm it's, it's annoying necessary. that they made that one joke for no reason. Right. It's not necessary. I mean it's a very sweet film and it's a very unrealistic film, but very sweet in a lot of ways. But the long duck dong character is not necessary. And and I actually wrote a character satirizing that uh for the next book, Passable in Pink, which Audible also did. 
and uh, Adam Scott was in it, and uh, Gillian Jacobs, Bob Odenkirk, Lorraine Newman, you know, even Judd Nelson. So all these people were in it. That's a and, huge cast for a movie making fun of 80s movies. That's amazing. But what happened was, I think Audible got scared that they that people would confuse what I was satirizing with something that I would condone, which I never would. So there was a character I created called the Chonger, which was created by the director and he's horribly racist uh, Asian character. And I think they got a little scared off about um, yeah. promoting this even more. So they sort of buried it, which is a shame because the cast was incredible. And my point was that in these movies, and I used to go see these movies in the eighties with my best friend who was Taiwanese American. He would always walk out shaking his head. It's like, what's the matter? He goes, I just can't believe that this is how we're, you know, this is how we are up there. And looking back, it's like sort of heartbreaking. So that's what I try to satirize. Uh, but I think, you know, when it comes to satire, there's a very small margin of error and you can very easily be confused with what you're trying to satirize. And I think Amazon Audible was afraid of that. Well, it's true. And also, if if not everybody 100 percent gets the joke then that person's like, well, that seemed really racist. And that's kind of what happens when and not everyone's going to be as tuned into all of the little nuances as you are because you are the author. So you're the one who's right. like, I'm making fun of this specific thing. But not everyone's like, no. I remember exactly that moment in that John Hughes film. Oh, that brings up another point. I remember something that you maybe tweeted or something. And uh, you said terrible things about my childhood hero, Ferris Bueller. And I was like, oh, I how can movie. how can it. Mike Sachs not like Ferris Bueller? Hate it. So. Salt in the Theater hated it at the time. I think he's a sociopath. I think <laughs> even worse than anything, he's boring. I mean, this is a white kid from the Chicago suburbs who goes into Chicago and look at it, look at his ideas of adventure, going to a museum, going to a Cubs game, <laughs> going to the stock market. I mean, wh what is this? Well, what, what do you want him to do? Play paintball? Go go zip? Zip lining? I just felt that he rob was, a bank. He wasn't interesting. I thought he was a bore, and I thought that he, even when I saw it originally as a kid in the theater, I thought he was a sociopath, a nut job. I mean, the way he was acting with his parents and with everyone else, I know, I know, I can see the appeal of it, but he's it's very just, manipulative. He's horrible. He's an awful, <laughs> awful person. And the way he treats his friend, I mean, the poor guy is on the verge of a, of a manic breakdown and pushing him and pushing him. Like, what does this kid need to get out of bed for? Hey, Cameron Fry had a much better life after destroying his father's precious car. And um, he, he had to have a talk. He forced him into a situation where he had to look in the mirror and make a change. I don't know. I mean... You're projecting. That is that did not happen. It did happen. He was horribly abused after that by his his father was crazy. Everyone in that film was crazy. It's a great cameo from Charlie Sheen in yes. the uh, police station. It is. Um, yep. Jennifer Grey was great yep. in it. She great was. Jennifer Grey movie. It was wonderful. Um, and the pedophile who played the principal or the vice yeah. principal was good too. Great. Do you want a gummy bear? They've been in my pocket. They're nice and squishy. And that's what the girl says to him <laughs> on, the, on the bus. Such a fun movie. Um, it moves fast. You know, it's a fun 80s movie because it moves fast. Well, that's um, a I, line from the film. Life moves fast. It does. And um, I heard they're doing a spinoff yeah. on the two guys that dro drove the car yes. at the at the at the parking garage. Right. To me, those are the most interesting people, like, even if they are stereotypes. What is their backstory? Like th they're not Richies from the suburbs. Oh yeah. Like let's. And there is and guys. there is a shitty thing that Ferris says to them, which is totally. He goes, "You speak English." Yeah. And the guy's like, "Uh, what country do you think this is?" And he's yeah. like, "Okay." And like that was definitely a terrible thing to say, and condescending, and he's a little prick, hundred percent. Good. I and see then that. they take agree with me. Oh, I do. I agree. <laughs> I just think it was fun that he that he rigged up the mannequin and the stereo to make it look like he was sleeping. Like that kind of like little inventiveness to me as a child was interesting and cool. Eighties inventiveness. Yeah, it was it was inventiveness. Um, but I love to see what they're going to do with the two guys who steal the car and go driving and what their adventure is. That is fascinating to me. That to me is a really clever way to take it into a different direction. Not Ferris Bueller growing up. Or if he ever got married to his girlfriend, it's 
take an offshoot and it's almost like an alternate history what yeah. happened while the uh um ferris was doing unfun things were these two actually having a fun time that is interesting to me while he's picking the only restaurant that his father goes to in chicago uh, yeah yeah um which brings up another interesting thing of rebooting these 80s uh juggernauts with cobra kai um, for the Karate Kid movies, uh, which were very popular, they went and they went to the bully and they made the updated version of Cobra Cry, which is taking the secondary character and making him the main character and making him less of a villain and right. more of a sympathetic hero version. Did you see any of the Cobra Kai? What's your opinion on those? I did. Truthfully, I couldn't get into it. I mean, in a lot of ways, people think that I'm hugely into this stuff. I don't really... <laughs> like watching this stuff i really don't it, you're a lot like of Mar marty why are you and every single person out there asking me unoriginal questions about 80s culture no 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 one's ever asked me that before everyone just assumes that i love it i don't i like a lot of stuff uh but it is not usually geared in a, a fresh take on nostalgia i think it's interesting how much I think the first season was, was really fun. It, it gets repetitive in that how many times can these high school, high school kids get into these karate fights yeah, yeah. in this small town in California where like they, they're they all not in jail by now? Like This doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> well, I will say this. The original movie I thought was fantastic at the time, and I loved Elizabeth Shue. I thought she was adorable. Oh, and yeah. uh, Ralph Adventures, in, ba Adventures yes. in Babysitting? Are you Saw kidding that me? In the theater. Great that movie. That was such a good movie. But this, these fresh takes written by aging Gen X, it just doesn't. I mean, listen, I'm doing the same thing, so I, I, I'm not one to talk here. But um, I'm not reading my own books. I'm just writing them. You're making other people read them. That's right. So that brings us to the newest book, which is Welcome to Woodmont College, No Refunds, which is a parody of a college course catalog, which is hilarious. And you can buy it now. It's on Amazon. And uh, and uh, what what prompted this? You wrote this with uh, hilarious writer Jason Roeder. Jason Roeder is one of the funniest writers I know. He was a head writer, head editor, one of the head editors of The Onion for a long time. Just done a lot of tremendous stuff. It has a new book out called Grief Strike that he wrote for McSweeney's. It's absolutely hilarious. So for this sort of thing, I grew up liking books that came before my time from National Lampoon, the uh, high school yearbook parody. Um, a couple of other parodies. I always liked parody, and I had uh, not seen anything done on college catalogs. And for some reason, I was receiving college catalogs at my current address, and it was always addressed to the previous tenant. I guess his son or daughter was going to high school, or graduating high school, going to college. So I would receive these really slick college catalogs. Uh, that were beautifully put together, beautifully designed, but just written terribly. And I thought it would be funny to sort of make fun of not only the writing in these catalogs, but also the state of higher education these days, where even going to a mediocre boutique school with a lot of problems would cost you sixty-five to 75000 a year. Yeah, it's like a very expensive daycare for your adult child. Or your 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 old your older child, your eighteen year old child. Yeah, I am not a fan of it. I don't think one needs to go to college, especially if you want to write. I think it's more important to have life experience. So I was sort of taking the piss out of, I guess, MFAs as well, uh, it, where you feel, you know, that one has to go to college to, to succeed. I just don't think it's it's uh, true. This book is so funny. There's so many jokes packed in. Um... You know, it's it's like thirty, it's like thirty-five page, you know, course catalog, full color, beautifully designed, looks just like a college course catalog. This is a great gift for a, you know, a senior in high school or someone in college or anybody who works in academia, at any academic job, anybody who works at a college. I think would really enjoy this as a as a gift because it's so funny. You know, anybody, anybody who's related to a college person or or is a, a college type. Uh, professor or works in administration will like this because it's so blunt. But you're bearing the lead. Who What's is publishing this? Oh, let me hold on. Let me look to see. You can't even see who's publishing this because it's such a parody. It doesn't say that it's a a parody book. Uh, humorist Books put yes. this out. Great 
the great humorous books and no one else was interested. So the fact that you were, (laughs) thank God for you because God bless. At the end of the line, humorous books was there to put out the book. (laughs) Nobody else wanted to. No one else wanted it. Um, this and just like as an, the importance of diversity at Woodmount College as of June 2019 by court order, <laughs> right? So th- there's a it, there's an index, a table of contents, and a map. So it's 35 pages, and there was some criticism from other publishers that it wasn't long enough. But for something like this, I think it's nice and dense, and it's the perfect length. And it's so dense. There's so many jokes per page. It is so funny, and it's so visually you know fun to look at and it has little bursts you know it has everything that a college course you know it has like the basic descriptions but then it has you know tons of illustrations tons of you know that has the campus map it has coupons for the local businesses like it's just like it, it builds it builds such a world that's part of this woodmont college and um you know i can't wait for the tv show or the movie that's going to spawn or well, the audible, hope, you know, the hope it will. I mean, this is one of the things we want. This is another example of putting something out and hoping that uh, people now can see it more clearly. I, I think it would make for a great um, TV show or a movie. I think it'd be a lot of fun. It'd be almost like a like a modern spin on a Animal House or one of those yeah. things where we have, you know, a, a different kind of central main character living in going to this crazy college that's super expensive but still not very good. Or prestigious. It's just That's like... That's a piece of shit, but it's not like uh, Animal House where the, the students are party animals. This is just total mediocrity across the board. Whether yes. it's fraternity members, whether it's the volunteer services, whether it's the teachers, everyone. Just total mediocrity. There's a fun... Um, and I don't know. It, I'm sure it has not aged well, but there was a show... There was a, a, a movie called PCU with Jeremy Piven. Yes, it was based on Wesley, and actually... I think my friend was in it as an actor. He knew the screenwriter, went to school with him at Wesleyan. But I have never seen the movie. Uh, I remember seeing... I saw it in the theater. I was in high school, and uh, we went. We, we would just sneak into movies. We would buy maybe one ticket... And then go to like three movies in a day. I used to do that all the time. It's so easy to do that then. So easy to do it. And they knew you were doing it and they didn't really care. They don't care. As long as as you bought concessions, they didn't care. As long as you went through the front door, which was downstairs, was down the escalator, you bought a ticket, you came in. And then once you're in, you're kind of in for the day. It's like going to the spa. Once you're in, you're kind of in. Yeah. And you just keep on. But I would always sneak. We would sneak stuff in. We wouldn't buy the concessions there either. We would go to the Taco Bell. At the mall, you'd go at the Marley Station Mall. You go to the, Station, yeah. you'd go to the, you'd go to the Taco Bell and you'd put the Taco Bell in your pants. And I remember having like a whatever burrito, and it was in my pants, and it opened. Oh Lord in heaven! And so there was like this burrito taco in my pants oh. that opened, and it went down, and oh, it was such a mess. <laughs> it was such a. Mess. I hope this wasn't a date. When your burrito <laughs> opens in your pants. <laughs> That's Marty. You should be ashamed of yourself. That's it's not even real meat dripping down your leg. It was like this weird kind of like sawdust meat with tons of oh. different hot sauces. Yeah. But in Maryland, no one would even bat an eye. That nobody everyone, would care. Someone's burrito was always opening up in their pants. You know what a very good high school movie is of the eighties is that Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Classic. And I've been trying to find the book that it was based on. It's very very difficult. Written by Cameron Crowe as like a sixteen or seventeen year old. Very difficult to find. But one of my favorite movies about that from that era, I think it's just fantastic. Because that feels like it's not it's not really making fun of any high school aged kids. It's much more like they're, you know, they're like competent main characters going through real emotional changes. Yes. And very realistic, very authentic. And you're right. It's not making fun of anyone, whether they were the cool ones or the geeks or the burnouts or anyone. Uh, I think all of them. And plus the 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 cast in that is phenomenal i mean the actors are just incredible in that and that's how i think that's at least how i remember a lot of high school age when you're working like did you have a job growing up in high school i worked at i can't believe it's yogurt which was a frozen yogurt store chain and it was in the um saverna park mall park plaza mall and um, so I worked in this frozen yogurt store after school and high school. Everybody that worked there was also a high school from Serena Park High School. Mostly it was the field hockey and cheerleaders. 
So it was just like the, the most popular, beautiful women in my high school, oh my. and me and this other guy named Scott, who was like a DJ on the side. So like we were like kind of the dorky people. So it was two dorky guys, and then a bunch of beautiful uh, high school aged uh, uh, cheerleaders and field hockey players. Uh, so it was kind of a dream come true. We were just friends with everybody. It was great. I gave away so much frozen yogurt. And then I had friends that worked at the Taco Bell, the Roy Rogers, the Subway Sandwiches, the um, – where else? And we, we we would all call and be like, what do we want for dinner tonight? And we would all just trade. Oh, yeah. We would just trade. And then I'd be like, who wants frozen yogurt? And I would give away whatever if I could get free dinner. The underground black market. Yeah. Now, was there – so you worked in – I can't believe it's yogurt. Was there a – the country's best yogurt nearby? TCBY, yeah, that would be at, they had those at the mall. There I was a competition. There was like a hot time for frozen yogurt. Yeah. But didn't um, they merge? Didn't it become, I can't believe it's the country's best yogurt after a certain point? I don't think so. Maybe. I know that my place, my store closed because I gave away too much frozen yogurt and they didn't make any profits. Oh, man. So they closed. And then the Baskin Robbins installed a frozen yogurt machine and they hired the people from my store because we knew how to take apart and clean the frozen yogurt machine, which is kind of a complicated machine. Um, and uh, so they hired me at the Baskin Robbins. So I worked at the 31 Flavors where Ferris Bueller passed out. I saw him pass out of 31 Flavors last night. Just a little Ferris Bueller quote for you. But now, was there fresh flavors uh, each month like they would have for ice cream? Do they have those for the yogurt? They would rotate the things for the yogurt. There was fat free, sugar free. I'd be like, it's fat-free, sugar-free, flavor-free. <laughs> oh, hello, my lady. <laughs> this is what I would always say at the, I can't believe it's yogurt, because we had toppings, right? So we had like peanut m and We had all that stuff. And we had one topping that was the most disgusting topping that I would always offer people. And I thought I was the funniest. Um, would you like wet nuts on that? <laughs> that goes well with uh, spilled burrito. Excuse me, would you like wet nuts on that? Because it, it was these walnuts in syrup, and mm. they were called wet nuts. And they had a little sign that said, wet nuts. Well, no wonder so, this place went out of business for guys. I'd always say, hey, do you want wet nuts on that? And I would just laugh. It Did was they... a very, I was very David Letterman focused type humor. So it was always just like, I would find something and just like do it over and over and over again. Because I thought it was hilarious. I can People envision would... you never getting laid. I did not do well in high school. <laughs> in that department. Or any department, it sounds like it. <laughs> I worked for 10 years at a record store in Maryland called Kent Mill Records. Kent Mill Music. Yep. Yeah. And oh, yeah. I used to love it. When I was 15 and then worked off and on through college uh, during holidays and summers. And um, I loved it. Uh, I, you know, I started young at 15 and I would work. Um, I don't, you know, looking back at what my parents allowed me to do, I would work nights and weekends and you know, I get home at 10 o'clock, but I, I, I felt like an adult. I would meet different people, talk about music, and it was fun. I loved it. We used to go to, I used to listen to 99.1 HFS, yeah, um, HFS, which was the most amazing radio station in the world. And they would have the HF Festival, which was this yeah. concert every year that was amazing music. It was all, and um, they would only sell the tickets at mm -hmm. Record and Tape Traders, Yep, which was a music store that sold record and tapes. And it was like maybe second run stuff. It had sad new stuff, but it also had used. You could go and use, you know, sell your used record and tapes there. And they would only sell the tickets for the HF Festival. It would be like 7 a.m. record and tape traders. Yep. So everybody would take their piece of shit cars that they had. And we would all have to line up in this parking lot at like one in the morning. And yep. people would start sh and they would just sit in the parking lot to wait to line up to buy these concert tickets. This is before Ticketmaster destroyed everything. You would have to sit there physically and wait in your car. And I remember waiting in my 1987 gray Oldsmobile with a couple of high school buddies. And we would get, like, just a bunch of fast food. And we would sit in this car all night to wait to go inside to buy these tickets. And it was so exciting and fun. Oh, yeah. I remember waiting outside at starting at 1, 2 a.m. for Bruce Springsteen tickets outside the Sears at Montgomery Mall. And it became a real sense of community. I mean, you do not see that anymore, but you would have people showing up, all obviously Bruce Springsteen fans. And it was almost like, it wasn't a competition, but it was almost a sense of achievement when you got those tickets. You earned those tickets. Yeah, you waited all night in this parking lot with like-minded, fun people. 
And, you know, we were up, we were talking to people, people were honking, people were playing music. It was like, it was fun. I can't, believe, was I can't believe my parents let me do this, but... Oh, I know, I know, that's another <laughs> thing. What? So what year was this? I, I may have been at this HF Festival. This might have, this, might, this was like 95, 95, probably okay. 90, 95, 96. Yeah. No, I don't, I'm not sure. I, I listened to it all the time. Um, but it became too much. It was all, it was an RFK stadium, right? And it was, it was such it was, a mess. It was in the summer, the heat of summer and you just oh, wanted yeah. to fucking die. It was so much fun. I would go with my buddies and we would go and people would have, you know, booze in water bottles and people would be sneaking junk in and people would get into mosh. I remember we got into a mosh pit by accident and we couldn't get out. We were terrified. We were all like, we like locked our elbows together. We were like, help, help. Because uh, we didn't know what we were doing. We weren't like into the mosh pitting no, stuff. And no. we were just, we were terrified and we were excited to be there. But we were like, you know, young, maybe like one of like, I was the oldest one of my friends. So I got my driver's license first. So I was 16, but they may not have been. And uh, because I was the first one to get my car, I, I was the one who was always driving everybody around. Um, so I was like, just constantly, I was like, just picking up every, can you go pick me up? Can you pick me up? I need a ride. Oh, so you were that asshole. I was the guy who was constantly picking everybody up. Like, you know, the parents liked me because I I got to drive their idiot kids around. Right. Because I had a car. Now, do you remember any of the bands that were there? Because when you look back at some of these alternative bands from that era, they're v very dated. Like Toad the Wet Sprocket. Oh, yeah, Love yeah, yeah. Two. Who do we have? Um, uh, Is it Mike? Not Mike Watt. Um, oh, yeah, Mike Watt had a solo album. Piss Bottle Man. Yeah. It came out around that time. Who is on there? Let me see here. The set list for 1995 HF Festival. Better Than Ezra, Bush, Candy Machine, Courtney Love, General Public, um, Mike Watt. I was right. Holy yeah, shit. Yeah. Look at you. Uh, PJ Harvey, Primus, oh, The Ramones, wow. Shudder to Think, Soul Asylum. Jesus. You kid are you kidding me? That's Amazing. A good, good lineup. And they That's would have good. two stages. And um, I remember that they would be, it would be like you'd buy a concert t shirt on the inside and it'd be really expensive. And you'd buy a concert t shirt right. on the outside and they had like misspellings. Yeah. Right. So I think I have, I have a concert or I had bought a concert t shirt that was the cheap one. It was like $10 and it spelled uh, Mike Watt wrong. How do you spell Mike Watt wrong? He was, I think they, they spelled it like um, uh, with a, with like a GH. Holy crap. Wait, that is something that I would prefer to have over the real yeah. one. Yeah, like the misprint is is it's better, is more Ooh. fun. Um, oh yeah, pavement, meat puppets before the '94 Afghan wigs, Toad Wet Sprocket. You were right, Violent Femmes. '94 was a big, big year. Counting Crows were there. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, pavement. Pavement. '90s music was a lot of fun, and, I love and that it. brings us to your book Slouchers, which is a uh, novelization of a '90s slacker movie. Right. Um, which is bites, reality single, bites all that shit that singles I at the it time. was wonderful it's so much fun how much you hate the things i love well i was working in a record store at this time and to me it was just a bunch of fakery it was just a bunch of shit nonsense and but that's another realm that's another era where you just if you didn't grow up in that era watching these movies you're not going to like singles reality bites um what's that one that took place at the record store Tower you know, Records, Empire em Records, Empire Records, like all Empire that Records. garbage. If you watch it now, it's just crap. Empire Records is great. Also, Airheads. Airheads is another one. Yep, a wonderful movie. So funny. Joel Mantegna plays this aging DJ. Uh, Brendan Fraser, Adam Sandler, Steve Buscemi are in a band called uh, uh, Lone Rangers. <laughs> and Joe Mantegna is like. Lone Rangers, and they're like, "Yeah, what, what's wrong with that?" Well, you're not exactly lone. <laughs> and uh, uh, Michael Richards, who was crazy Kramer at the time, he plays like a radio executive, and they're gonna they're gonna flip the radio station from alt rock uh, to easy listening, and it, it, this whole r radio revolt happens. Very, gr it's a wonderful time capsule of a radio movie. That. I did rewatch Richard Linklater's movie that took place in the '90s in a parking lot. Uh, forgetting the name of it, but I found that to be really good. But that was written by a great playwright, um, Eric Bog Bogazian, Bogazian. You're very well read and, and well watched. What are you watching now? Uh, actually, I am not well watched. I usually watch absolute <laughs> garbage that no one else wants to watch. It's usually 
anything on the Criterion channel or during baseball season, it's the Orioles. But right now I am watching, which is rare because usually I'm in my room writing a reading, but I'm writing The Last of Us, uh, which I was not even aware of. That so good. Your game had no idea. So good. I, I started watching the first episode and I was like, wait, is this another zombie thing? I just watched a bunch of Walking Dead. I don't feel like more zombie stuff. So I didn't oh, watch God. it. Walking and then Dead. I came back the next week and I was like, holy shit, this is so much more than just a zombie post-apocalyptic so much action. More. I mean, so Nick much Ackerman more. In that role, in yeah. the third episode, people Amazing. were talking about it. I had no idea. I watched it. It's a beautiful performance. It's gorgeous. He is a brilliant actor. Like, that is what I like. I like stories. I don't necessarily like people being chased by zombies. Right. But, like, stories about people having to deal with post-apocalyptic and how they do it, that, to me, is interesting. And those two characters, those two amazing actors... Uh, Nick Offerman and the Australian actor who was in White Lotus. Season yeah, he one. was great. So great in White Lotus. Phenomenal acting. I loved that. And great writing. I just, it was really, over, it was just beautiful. And I just saw Tar, which I liked a lot, uh, the movie Tar. But, you know, did you see that yet? No. Okay. Well, there's an ending that confused the shit out of me uh, I, that's also based on video games, of which I do not know. But I thought it was related to a cult the last scene and it, it isn't but that to me made it even more interesting but i was totally off base with that one but anyway that's another movie that's out uh by a really good director he did in in the kitchen or in the bedroom uh with sissy spacek it takes place in maine about a murder and if you you haven't seen that movie you you have to check it out it's a really terrific movie i will watch it i'm on another yeah. list a, a friend of mine gave me a list of movies that i had to watch and i hadn't seen so many of them so i was going through and i saw um uh, I watched what's it called RRR, which is like uh, kind of a Bollywood action uh, movie that's on I want to say Netflix right now. It's really long, uh, but it was incredibly beautiful. Like every single scene of this movie is gorgeous and like Ooh. a like a high budget uh, like music video type over the top commercial. Like it was really fun. Um, and then I watched uh, Ingrid Goes West, which is a um uh uh. uh who am I thinking of? She was just on SNL. She she was just on White Lotus. She's from Delaware. Um, Audrey Plaza. Oh, Plaza, I love her. Audrey Plaza. So she was in this movie called Inger Goes West, and it was very funny about this uh, this this depressed girl that moves to uh, Los Angeles and starts becoming obsessed with this Instagram um, influencer. Oh, interesting. I just saw very her in the movie came out a couple years ago, uh, where she plays um, sort of a con artist uh, selling. Things that she shouldn't be selling. Is this the thought, Emily the Criminal? Yeah, I loved it. I thought she. I, I just started. Uh, I put that on, and then I didn't get in. I, I couldn't keep watching it, but I, I do want to yeah. watch Emily the Criminal. That looks great, and a bunch just of people have been telling me how good. Terrific. That is. Now, one thing I, I can tell you that I fucking hate is the new Paul Giamatti Verizon ad, in which he says "kaput." He plays Einstein. Have you seen these ads? I've seen the ads. I have seen. I just want to shoot out the screen when I see these. It's, they're that bad that I just. I mean, these are bad. Now, it may work to their favor that people remember them because they're so bad. But if you haven't, if you've seen these move, the commercials, you know what I'm talking about. It's just like you're, you're embarrassed for the guy. And I love Paul Giamatti, but his yeah. his uh, imitation of of um, what's his name? Uh, the sign. Yeah. Einstein is just beyond repair. It's just awful. Well, I, I saw someone else post something like uh, uh, about Paul Giamatti. It was like in you know the years when he was doing Sideways. It was like, what can't he do? And now it's, what won't he do? Yeah, I know. And it's you're like, come on, Paul. It's a little disappointing. I mean, you never know why people take on various projects. I mean, these ads are obviously for money. But man, and I'm, I'm not even blaming him as much as the writers for this shit. It is just garbage. Yeah. So your new book, speak of garbage. I want. <laughs> I do want to talk about slouchers though, because um, I think we're gonna humorous books is gonna be putting out slouchers. Yes. Um, in a, a as a as a bigger as a bigger push, and um, so tell me the the quick version of the story for slouchers. There is a fancy college grad from the East Coast who heads out to Seattle just as the video for. Um, Nirvana's Smells Like Teen Spirit breaks. It's the height of grunge. 
and she moves out there and ends up working in a record store and all the characters are sort of a conflation of all the mo- all the characters from the Gen X movies. The older guy who's a banker, um, the record store owner who's uh, gruff but lovable, and all the losers that she hangs out with, some of whom literally live in the parking lot. So it's just a uh, conflation of everything from these movies that I liked at the time but don't really like now. So it's sort of taking the piss out of this time when – it was a slacker, so-called slacker generation, but it was promoted very heavily by corporate uh, entities and advertising and just pushed like the hippie world was after it hit its peak in the late 60s, early 70s. But the cool thing right now that I am enjoying is that the 18-year-old generation are all getting into the 90s. Yes, I know. Isn't that like interesting? Like crazy. Yeah. Like everyone loves the 90s again, which is yeah. wonderful. I love the 90s. I still have my 90s clothes because I am yeah. uh, I never buy anything new. So I still have my cargo pants from Abercrombie and Finch. Or and up Bridges, against the wall. Up against the wall. Or the original <laughs> um, Banana Republic where it was very safari clothes. Yes. Well, what's funny is that like I'll see these young Gen Z women wearing these waist-high uh, jeans that became so unfashionable starting in the late 90s and it's just like of all the things to pick of all the fashions that is what they chose it just fascinates me but then again it is 30 years old now right and it's it's decades ago so they're looking at it like we looked at the 50s or the 60s growing up well the thing about the 90s everything was really nice and baggy oh yeah so people like the baggy clothes like the baggy jeans people wore big um you know the comfortable uh flannel People love yep. the flannel. We love to be like uh, big sort of big sweaters. We love to look, look kind of lumberjacky. Yeah. It's, it's a great right. time. Well, that was the thing. I mean, we would look Northwestern uh, like we lived in Seattle when we were loggers. But in reality, we were, you know, I was living in New Orleans or outside D.C. So we were hardly loggers. Yeah. we But we like the look. The look worked for us. The big boots. Yep. I'm into it. Big I'm chunks. welcome. I'm welcoming it all back. Well, that's the thing too. Like it, this hasn't been parodied or satir- uh, satirized this this era. So it's like these two little pockets. Whether it's the late seventies trucking and, C- and CB or early to mid nineties grunge Gen X, it just hasn't really been done. And this is another instance where I think it could be a funny TV show or a movie. You could take it out, and w- if you satirize it, I think it'd be very. Uh, funny to those who are now into 90s and those who came up with the 90s. I just haven't seen it done before. I completely agree, and I can't wait to put this book out, and we're going to put it out, and then also this is going to go out. We're going to see Welcome to Woodmont. Possibly Welcome to Woodmont could be, uh, you know, it could be modern day or it could be whenever. You know, these things yes. could all be... Who yeah, knows? I love it. Also, uh, for some reason, I found myself on this Tubi, on the Tubi app, and I was looking for TV shows on Tubi, and I ended up on ALF recently. And uh, the heyday of a puppet running oh, a TV okay. show, amazing. Yeah. I, I was watching ALF, and I'm like, people are loving ALF. This is a great show. How can how, how can this have been so popular? But it was. It was so popular. ALF. Well, here's something, and this show is about um, um, admitting to something embarrassing in your life. And this is a perfect segue. I have never seen ALF. Oh, man, you got to watch ALF. It's on Tubi. It's free. So people should download Tubi. It's, but you know, I have ads, a friend, Nick Cooler of Found Footage, who is obsessed with ALF. So through him, I sort of learned things. But I personally have never seen this show. It's very interesting. And then I didn't know this. I was talking to Mike Reese, who's a, a Simpsons. Uh, you know Mike Reese. He's a Simpsons yeah. executive producer. He's been a writer for, for years and years and years. And he wrote on the Carson. And he wrote on ALF. I didn't know that. That's fascinating. And he was was telling me about Alf and the guy who the movie Permanent Midnight is based. Oh, I'm friendly with him. Yeah, uh, Jerry Stahl. So Jerry Stahl wrote on Alf. Yes, he did. And then the book is about like the amount of substances he was on while he was writing Alf, I believe. It is. Um, And then uh, Ben Stiller made a movie out of it, Permanent Midnight. Jerry Stahl is a fantastic writer. Uh, he has a new book out about visiting uh, concentration camps in Germany, which you have to 
read and buy it's fantastic but permanent midnight is a classic where he was on heroin he would turn in scripts that would have uh blood his own blood on it from shooting up heroin and just the fact that he would wow. not, not only do that but but later talk about it and admit to it uh is just to me one of the funniest things he, he's a great writer and the fact that he was writing for alf it was such a misfit uh and his scripts were like notoriously awful I wouldn't mind actually publishing those scripts. That just gave me an idea. I would love to publish those scripts. Wouldn't you I, like to do that? That'd be I'd, fun. I'd like to see them. I'd like to talk to Mike Reese about, I think Mike Reese was telling me about the scripts and how they would have to rewrite. Maybe they had to rewrite everything just because yeah. he would get yeah. them and they would be completely yeah. incoherent. And then yeah. they would rewrite them and then they would be great. And then people would be like, yeah, this guy can really write. And they're like, well, no, we rewrote everything. How's this for an idea for, for Weekly Humorist? publishing just put out the scripts as is that could be something we could be like the 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 now discovered original alf scripts from from this time you 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 can make that happen but written by a heroin addict yeah. on heroin i mean to me that would be more interesting than looking at the finished script right can we get those that might be a job for I'll you to, to dig I'll those up them. yeah but we'll have to do them so they look scanned in and they have like blood on them Right, like it's uh, the first generation of them, like it was photocopied at the local library. Yeah, when you have to put like coins in the photocopy machine <laughs> at the Seven Eleven, oh, which yeah. we used to have to do. Remember, in the top of the photocopy machine would like bend up two yeah. times. Yep, it would like had a double bend, and then it would have a um, a fax machine too that you would put quarters in. Ah, the days of quarters. I actually just used I used a printer at a coffee shop in Park Slope. Um, it was pretty much the same setup, only I had to do it through an app. But it was almost the exact same situation where I was pushing a button. I was paying them via PayPal, but it was still I was paying to, just to use the printer. And I've never machine. heard of that. I didn't know this existed anymore. If you go to Conditory Coffee Shop on Fifth Avenue in Park Slope, they have a printer scanner that you can print uh, full color if you need to. I used it because my printer wasn't working. I had to print out a return label for something. And I just happened in there and I was like, oh, you guys have like a printer. They're like, yeah, I'm like, I need to print something. And I did it. I mean, it was a little bit more step full than just putting a coin in a 7-Eleven copy machine. But I had to like email uh, a random email address, the printing label, and then they printed it out. And I mean, I, I wouldn't use it to print my taxes, but yeah, it was, it was good enough for a FedEx label, label. But look at you, the exotic life of Marty. I mean, that's... <laughs> That's wild. You know, it's life in the fast lane. Like Ferris Bueller says, life moves pretty fast. I'll say. <laughs> well, thank you, Mike Sachs. Thank you. Um, the new book the new book that's out now is Welcome to Woodmont College, No Refunds, written with Jason Roeder. Get it now. Uh, hard copy uh, can, be, can be to you in two days on Amazon. It's a great gift for anybody who works in the college world or uh, a high school kid going off to college. Very funny book. Uh, coming up, we're going to have slouchers from humorous books and get out there and buy the new issues of uh, of Randy and Snicker Let's Loose, which is out now through a new publisher. Who's the new publisher of those big books? Random House is distributing the books and Archway Editions is the publisher. That's fantastic. Congratulations with all Thank that. Thank you, man. It's doing really well. Thank uh, you. Follow Mike Sachs at Mike B. Sachs. Is that correct on Twitter? That's right. Mike B. Sachs, S-A-C-K-S. No, actually, it's Michael B. Sachs on Twitter. Michael B. Sachs on Twitter, yeah. Mike B. Sachs on Instagram. Yes, and it's Mike B. Sachs at gmail.com. And email me. I love hearing from people. Email Mike B. Sachs, and he will, uh, he'll tell you some crazy tales about all kinds of stuff. Also, we didn't even talk about your regular job. You're writing for Vanity Fair still. You're still at the Condé Nast uh, yeah. conglomerate world. Well, more um, New Yorker now than Vanity Fair writing, but I, I do work editorial on Vanity Fair. Well, very fantastic. Well, con congrats on the continued success at the New Yorker. Oh, and you. and and you've been writing for McSweeney's and the New Yorker in those places for a long time. A long time. I mean, McSweeney's, I, I, when I first submitted in 98, 99, Dave Eggers was the editor. He would write you back whether he liked it or not. That's how long ago it was. It's a pretty long time ago. It's a long time. Yeah. And you're still there. So go to uh, MikeSacks.com and you can see all of his books and you can um, listen to his podcast, Doing It with Mike Sacks, which I will be a voice on the uh, yes. World of the Worlds Maryland edition very soon. Oh, yes. I will have the my amazing producer, Rob Schulte, get in touch with you. This is going to work out just fine, Marty. I love it. 
Thank you so much. Thank um, you. Have a wonderful rest of your day. I'll see you next time. Thanks for uh, listening and watching, everybody. Bye-bye.